You gotta love the fact that distrowatch.com has never updated their webpage to be mobile friendly. I love it. Greetings and salutations. Joe Collins here. I have got a little follow-up video to my last video where we took a deep dive into Debian without any net. Nothing. I didn't read anything. I did no research. I didn't do nothing. I downloaded it and I put it in a virtual machine and I tried to get it running and what you saw in that video was exactly what I saw when I was trying to get it running. And that video generated a lot of comments. And so therefore, I would like to answer a couple of those comments and expand on them a bit here. And since this is a follow-up video, it probably would be a good idea for you to check out the original video if you have not seen it. I will put a link in the description for this video. Or it just may pop up at the end of this one. However you want to do it, it, it will, it'll help. Uh, the gist of the last video is the fact that I didn't do any research. I just installed it, and I stumbled my way through it, and uh, I got a lot of comments on that. And some of those I would like to address and expand on a bit here. Let's go ahead and do that right now, shall we? Our first comment comes from a fellow named Wayne Foots. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He said you couldn't install the guest editions because they're installed out of the box. All you had to do was set the resolution to match your monitor. Yes, it is true. I spent a great deal of time in that last video trying to figure out why it was I could not install the VirtualBox guest editions in the virtual machine that I had set up and installed Debian into. No, the guest editions were not installed. And I can tell you that because they weren't functioning properly. If they were installed, they certainly weren't functioning properly. Let's put it that way. One of the main things that guest editions does is facilitate accelerated video from the guest through the host to the video card. And it sets up a auto scaling feature within the guest that if you resize the window, the guest's resolution is automatically resized to fit perfectly. So it's not a matter of setting your resolution. You shouldn't have to think about it. Uh, the guest editions also facilitate a lot of other things like uh, a bi-directional clipboard where you can copy and paste text back and forth from one operating system to the next. Also, you can set up shared folders and you can set up USB forwarding so that when you plug a USB device into the host that you can make it appear on the guest machine. A lot of things and none of that was working. So no, uh, they were not installed. Also, Gwen Walcott asked, why didn't I attempt using Synaptic? Well, it wouldn't have worked. Um, if I couldn't run the script directly from the um, little virtual guest editions CD I put in there, it would not have worked from Synaptic. She also points out that a little button had popped up that said, run software. I honestly did not see that because I was looking for a pop-up. But even if I had clicked run software, I can tell you for sure that it would not have run. There's a couple of things going on here, and I did a little research after the video. First of all, for whatever reason, Debian will not allow you to execute code from a DVD or CD. And since this was a, you know, it's a virtual CD we put into the system, it treated it just like a disk. And some people had said in comments that you needed to copy that over to the main opera you know like to your home directory and then it would run and some other people said well you could remount it into slash mnt and then it would run and that just leaves me shaking my head wondering why it's set up that way in the first place i mean every linux distribution that i have used over the last 10 years you could at least get the script to run and then VirtualBox would tell you that it couldn't uh, install it for one reason or the other, which in Debian it would not have been able to because with a net install of Debian, they don't put in the kernel headers. You don't get a, a compiler. There's no GCC. Uh, you're not getting the development tools. So you would have to go and install that first. Then you would have to come back and run that script, which would build that from source and then put it into the system to make it work because it has to build kernel modules. So it wouldn't have worked at all. None of it would have worked. And um, 
Apparently, that's just not real high up on Debian's list of priorities, is making their system run slick in a virtual machine. Uh, VirtualBox, by the way, is a standard. It's cross-platform, and those who develop Linux distributions really ought to think about making the VirtualBox experience as nice as they can, because that's where a lot of people, especially not in the Linux world, are experiencing uh, Linux. That's how they're interacting with it. So don't make it hard for them. And in 2023, I really have to wonder why Debian is making it hard for people to run scripts off of CDs and DVDs, which, uh, if you ask most people these days, is old technology anyway. I still have a whole lot of CDs, so I have CD drives in my machines, but that's another story for another video. Um, this fella, or lady, I don't know which, uh, said here, I will just say this is V-I-I-C-H-R-S-V-I-I. -I -I. Uh, maybe that's Chris? I'm not really sure. Anyway, it said, after watching uh, Learn Linux TV's video on Debian 12, the first 12 things you should do after installation, this was hard to watch. Well, I guess it was. Um... Jay wouldn't have done something like this. Uh, that's not his flavor. Uh, Jay likes to do his research, and when he puts his videos together, he makes it look very slick and makes it look super easy. And maybe if I had spent some time doing some research on Debian and learning all the tips and the tricks and the things that you should activate and the terminal commands that you should run to make it a usable system, I would have been able to do that too. Um, but that's just not what I decided to do. I decided to do a video what it would be like for somebody who didn't know anything about Debian just to grab it and download it and throw it up and see if they could get it to work. A lot of people ask me, why did I choose the GNOME desktop? Um, real simple. That was the desktop that was offered as default. That was the one that was checked. So I went with the defaults, pretty much. Um... As I said in the video, I found that there were upsides to the installation process, and I found some downsides as well. I, I really don't understand why users are being prompted to set a, a domain, for instance. That's the, not something that desktop users usually need to deal with. And, of course, the whole notion of having the root account with an activated password and all that, it's, it's kind of strange. However, somebody pointed out in the comments that if I had left that blank, it would lock it. And... Um, I think they answered and said that it the installer was smart enough to give the uh, prime user, the first one created, uh, pseudo privileges, or sudo privileges, that's the correct pronunciation on that. Um, but, you know, I just went along with the bouncing ball. It asked for a root password, I gave it one. They prefer that. I don't like that. So, anyhow. So, yeah, it's a very different, uh, different approach between me and Jay and... To tell you the truth, you're probably going to see a lot more of this kind of stuff on my channel because I find that to be way more interesting than prepared videos where everything is like, look how smart I am and I'm going to show you how everything works. I have found that the more research I do and the slicker I make the video, the less people watch it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to go that direction. Um, this last comment is going to cause some people out there to say, well, you should have just deleted that guy. You didn't need to respond to that. But I'm going to do it anyway because uh, we're dealing with Linux and there's always one or two of these dudes in every crowd or dudettes. I'd have no idea what the uh, gender of the person who wrote this was. But being that it's Linux and about 97% of the people who watch my channel are male, I can assume this is a male and probably be right. You know what I mean? But anyway, Tannen Guitar said, Just stick with Linux Mint and enjoy memory leaks all the time when reading a bit how to use Debian is too much. <laughs> they did it for free, right? Okay, there's a couple of things I want to address here. First of all, first of all, um, well, let me read my reply because I, I copied that in here as well because I thought my written reply was really getting at what I wanted to say, but there's some stuff I want to add to this. Uh, I said this was for fun, and there's no need to be a dick about it. Uh, I mean, and there really isn't, because I said at the beginning of the video, 
I did no research. I have read nothing. I'm not familiar with Debian. Let's see what we get. All right. Uh, but I went on to say, but I certainly, it certainly brings to light how needlessly cryptic Debian is and how little they invest in trying to make it easy for new users. This is why we have Ubuntu and Linux Mint. And that's the truth. That's exactly why we have it. Uh, is because Mark Shuttleworth, way back in the early 2000s, looked at Debian and went, hey, this is a great system. It's very stable. It's secure. But boy, they're slow in updating things. And they don't make it super easy for new users. Maybe we can do a little better. Boom, we have Ubuntu based on Debian testing. That's how that happened. Ubuntu has a quicker cadence of releases than Debian does. You see, Debian is getting a lot of attention right now because we're at release time. But two or three or four or five years down the road when we're waiting for Debian 13 to come out, nobody's going to be talking about it. Uh, maybe they have started to release their systems a little quicker these days, uh, but Debian has always been noted for using very old libraries and very old versions of software and uh, if that's something that doesn't bother you be my guest some people find ubuntu to be restrictive when it gets into the latter stages of a long-term support release so yeah um it, it, that's why we live in the linux world that we do you might even go as far as to say that ubuntu is the reason why debian is still around is because Debian gets a lot of attention because Ubuntu is based on it. The difference between the number of people that use straight Debian, Debian and Ubuntu, Debian, I can say that word, see, is, is huge. I mean, like, we're talking probably 100 to 1. There's more people using Ubuntu on the planet than Debian. So that's just the truth. And the last part of what he said is something that I hear a lot, and it uh, kind of bugs me a little bit. This is like, they did it for free, right? Like, somehow I'm being disrespectful by testing out Debian and pointing out what I don't like because these people are offering it for free. Why is it that there is this assumption that because you are allowing people to download something for free that somehow that should give you a free pass and it shouldn't be up to par and you should be immune from criticism that you 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 know people might disagree with what you're doing and might say something about that uh just because you're offering it for free or volunteering your time to work on it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody should kiss your ass and uh, i'm a firm believer that if you take the time to invest into using something that uh, you have a right to you know respectfully say uh, i don't appreciate this or uh, i don't like this or or could we change it and make it better now i will agree that anybody who goes into the forums for any linux distribution which are usually run by people who are volunteering their time to help others and they come in with a negative attitude and be like, well, this is crap and it doesn't work. And so therefore I'm not going to uh, use it uh, or no, you, you need to make this right for me because I have invested all this time into doing this and it said it would do it and now it doesn't do it. If you go in there with that attitude, that's wrong. And that's when you really need to be aware. Hey, you're not dealing with a corporation. This is not a product you paid for. This isn't Microsoft or Mac support that you're dealing with. This is a community of people working on a project and you're going to get a lot further if you go in there being respectful and, and being honest and saying, hey, I'm new. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. This might be my fault, but I don't know. This is the problem that I'm having. If you do that, that's great. So in that case, yes, I agree. I mean, you should have the respect for people who are volunteering their time. But this thing that goes around about, well, it's it's free, so you should just, you know, be happy with what you get and keep your... No, I don't agree with that at all. None. Zero. Zip. So I wanted to respond to those comments. And, and that was a good video. And yeah, expect more stuff like that out of me, because I'll tell you why. The one I did before that, where we uh, talked about uh, whether or not you needed a home partition while I sat there and played around with VirtualBox... <laughs> 
man hit video did well <laughs> so um you know i'm thinking this is how we're going to go in the future and i have a something i'd like to throw out at the end here and uh and that is, uh, talk a little bit, just a few moments about life after Ubuntu. You know, the folks at Ubuntu, and if we jump over here to distrowatch.com, uh, don't you just love the fact that DistroWatch has not uh, updated their page at all to be friendly to mobile devices? I love that. I think it's awesome. Um, you'll see over here, uh, if you look all the way to the right on your screen, that we have the DistroWatch top 100 which is completely unscientific all this is is the number of clicks on distro watch this distribution of linux gets that's all it is mx linux is sitting at number one which is based on debian and then we have endeavor os which i'm not super familiar with uh and then we've got mint at number three manjaro at number four and debian at number five and pop os at number six how many of those are based on Ubuntu? Well, let's see. I'm not sure about Endeavor, but I know Mint is based on Ubuntu. Pop OS is based on Ubuntu. And Ubuntu proper is 8. Linux Lite is based on Ubuntu. I'm just going down here and looking at all the stuff that's based on Ubuntu. KDE Neon is based on Ubuntu. Uh, let's see. What else we got down here? Um, PC Linux OS is based on nothing. <laughs> they take no crap from nobody. <laughs> they have RPM packages, but use Synaptic Package Manager to manage them. How cool is that? I really need to look into that OS a little bit more. That might be the next thing we look at. Anyway, if you look down here, a lot of these are based on Ubuntu. Somehow or another, they are in the Ubuntu world. Canonical, the company that uh, distributes Ubuntu, um, they uh, kind of, sort of... <laughs> are making people nervous these days with some of the things that they're doing. And they have done that in the past as well, you see, because Canonical has a problem, and that is they have this product that they give away, and they're trying to figure out how to make money with it. Okay, so in the past, back when we had the Unity desktop, they used to team up with Amazon so that when you do a search, Amazon would try and sell you something. So if you wanted to open the program Bracero, for instance, which is a CD and DVD burner, uh, you typed in bra, and what you got was advertisements for braziers. <laughs> it's true. Uh, that didn't work out too well. Well, their latest thing now, and if I just use my old up script, you guys know what that is, right? You're going to see that we're going to get some text up here on the screen. I just updated this machine. We are looking, by the way, at one of my laptops that's running vanilla Ubuntu. You see that we are nagged when we do updates here. It says, get more security updates through Ubuntu Pro with ESM apps enabled. Basically, this is a new service they have where you'll get security updates if you sign up for this in the universal repo where... In the past, you have not. The universe repo, not universal, but it's a universe repo. And basically, that's a lot of stuff from Debian and things that they include. Um, and they have not traditionally updated that in the past, and now they do. But you have to get on their list. I think the deal is that you get five licenses if uh, for free. But, you see, you have to register your machine, which means that you're giving Canonical your information. I don't know how much of that is uh, that you have to give them, whether you have to give them your address and phone number and all that crap, because I haven't looked into this. But this is making people nervous. So, once again, we may be dealing with Canonical making a stupid decision that scares away users. And there are a lot of people who are wondering, hey, do I really need to be using this Ubuntu-based distribution of Linux? Hence, you have lots of interest these days in like Linux Mint Debian edition. MX Linux is number one on the list. That's based directly on Debian. So expect a new version coming out soon. You have all of this stuff going on out there. So I was wondering um, what your thoughts were on that uh, since you have stuck to the end of this. What distribution of Linux are you currently using? And if it is an Ubuntu based distribution, let's say that Ubuntu went poof tomorrow. For some reason or another, you could no longer use Ubuntu. Which one would you go to? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. I certainly do appreciate it. We'll do it again soon.